So uh, right, so um, how to get yourself heard in the music industry. So we've got like a panel here. I'm sure you know as much as we do, but we're talking from our perspective here. So what the first thing I'll do is get them to introduce themselves. You've just appeared, haven't you? I've seen you before. So start at that end saying who you are, what you do, and then to come back this way. Um, thank you. Uh, my name's John and I play the band with the cut-ups and I put on uh, shows under the name Freaksy in Exeter. My name's Bar um, and I uh, was working with an organisation called OneFest, uh, music industry, training and development, um, social enterprise that put on a nice gig at the Roundhouse uh, in May in association with Frank Turner. Well, then, my name is Nick and I play in a rock band called Sanguine. Hi, uh, I'm Andy, I'm from the Musicians Union, um, and I cover Wales and South West England for them. Hello, um, my name is Claire Rose, I work for PRS Music as the Education Outreach Manager for the South West. Hi there, I'm Marie Belston and I'm representing MIDI, Music in Devon, .org, um, and I've had a number of different roles in the music industry over the last 30 years. So, uh, so a lot of different fields of expertise here, and I guess there's lots of different types of people out there as well. I mean, I'm kind of guessing there's a lot of people in bands here, or is it, put your hands up if you're in a band or you're making music. And what, is, is anybody here does anything else apart from making music, like, like media? Researcher. Researcher. Yeah, yeah, okay. Right, so, so and there's a perennial problem, how to get your music heard, you know, you've got your band together, you got it pretty tight, some of the songs are sounding good. How do you get it out there? How do you get gigs? How do you get yourself uh, on the, written about the internet, maybe? Or, or how do you uh, get played the radio? Uh, I won't even bother with TV. TV's like a poor in this country for music. Uh, so how, how do you get, propagate your music out there? It's, it's, a, it's a lot easier when I live in Manchester. It's a, very, it's a big media city. There's a lot of things going on there, a lot of venues. Very plugged into the uh, music. I mean, mainstream. Exeter's a cool little town, but it's, it's, on this, it's on the side of things, and I imagine you feel slightly cut off here. It's a bit more difficult to get yourself heard. It's not a nearby kind of circuit of venues. Maybe there is, I want to find this kind of thing out. So, the first thing is, you know, how do you present yourself in a way that makes your band seem far more interesting than it really is? I think that's kind of the question here. Music's about perception. How do you perceive something to be more as being interesting, like a, uh, something that's got a value to it? The world is full of bands. I mean, I've been around music for a long time. There's probably more bands on a higher level now than there ever has been before. I don't want to put anybody off here. But when I started bands, there's probably about 10 bands in, in every city now, it's a 10 on each road. So how do you get yourself heard more the noise? So uh, what we'll do is stop down there, because you're, you're putting gigs on. So, so if, say, say, band X in here wants to approach you to get a gig, what, what's the best way of doing it? I wouldn't bother. i do it yourself. Um... I come from a little town called Columpton, which is 15 miles from here, and if it's a small, Columpton's really small. Um, the last bus home was 10 in the, 10 in the evening. There's nothing you could do, so we just find places where we could do our own stuff, with our mates who like the, our own stuff. Um, we just kind of create a thing around what we liked. Why did we bother kind of fitting into someone else's box when we could just do it ourselves? Um, there's no validation in pleasing someone else. It's all about pleasing yourself. So we went out there, we made it happen. And then you find like-minded people uh, in other towns who are also doing it themselves. And we're really lucky in Exeter to have a cavern, which is built on that principle of doing it yourself. So if you turn up wanting to do it yourself, showing that you've done it yourself, put on your own gig, put on your own band, put on your mate's bands, uh, suddenly you've got something going for you, that's what I do. Yeah, I just want to pick up a few points there. It's, I mean, DIY was one of the founding principles of punk rock, you know, this idea of DIY. But I also like the idea of DIT, doing it together, you know, this idea you can work in collectives or whatever. So you're saying you work with all the venues around here as well. I mean, yeah. How do you set up something like that? Do you actually get in touch with the venues directly or other musicians tell you about good places? I, I think the thing is, there's all these, you'll have heard all these routes of getting a venue to hear your record or getting promoters to take notice of you. The truth is, promoters notice people who are interested in what they're doing. So, um, you can bombard someone with emails, email, email, email. <coughs> Honestly, it just bounces off. If you go to someone's show, if you show that you're interested, uh, you come to punk rock shows or metal shows or reggae shows or whatever you're doing and be part of that thing, that's really important. You learn about 
the stuff that's good that's coming to where you're from, but also you learn the people doing, you meet the people doing stuff, you do it together, like John said. I mean, John knows like, more about punk rock than I do, but you're there in the kind of midst of it, rather than being um, either someone who buys into it or someone who expects to be bought into, you're a participant in it. I think there's loads to be said there. I mean, this is a really good point here, this idea of community, I think that's a really strong thing. I think when you, when you play music in bands, it's quite isolated in a sense, because you're playing with three, four, whatever, or one of the mates, and you get lost in your own little bubble of the world. Social networking is fantastic, we'll come on social networking at some point, because it gives you a worldwide reach. But in a, in a way, you still can't be that old-fashioned human contact, can you? So, and that idea that if you're making music, you should be supporting your local scene, it's a very old idea, but it's actually very... <coughs> important idea and can you elaborate on that and how how that will work I and mean, it's not just going to the gig and standing in the corner at the back is it i mean i know for most musicians apart from those guys at the back noisy guys at the back but quite um, introverted people it's, yeah. it's not i mean the reason a lot of people make music is they find it hard to communicate with everyone else in the world that's what music is there for in a way how do, how do those people get involved you know you can't you can't be a wallflower in a gig can you well I mean, not, I'm not a capitalist about it, but literally your ticket price buys you participation in the thing. You've made a thing happen. So I put on a band and it cost me £500. You know, the person gets £300, it's £150 to hire the venue, it's £50 to feed them. £500. Now if you come along and pay your £5 as one of 100 people, I'm going to take serious interest in what you think and what you care about and the band that you're in. Uh, in, in that sense, you buy into it. it it's not shares. You don't... Um, <laughs> there's no comeback from it, you don't get £10 back when it's really successful, except you get everything from it. You get to see the best bands in the world, you get to be part of this thing, you get to meet, I mean, if we're in bands, if we're wallflowers, if we're oddballs, which we probably all are, you get to meet other oddballs, you know. When I was at school, um, everyone was normal, they had their plans, they now all run suntan lotion shops, um, and good for them. But I got to meet the people who were weird like me, who also cared about weird things like I did. Uh, and that's so much more interesting. And, and so by participating in that thing, you get to absolutely be organically in that thing. You know if you stand too close to a tree for a million years, the tree grows around you, right? That's what, that's what the scene's like. The thing grows around you. You're shaped by it, and it's shaped by you. That's quite poetic, aren't <laughs> By the speech, but, and, but there's also um, there's a practicality to this as well. I mean, if you band X and they, they came to your thing and they were paying to get in and they were supporting the gigs, what, what do they present to you to actually get a gig? Is it just like saying, well, look, by the way, I'm in the band, you go, oh, nice one, just come open the next show, or, or is it a way of presenting themselves to you, like online or musically yeah. or a CD or a SoundCloud? I and mean, what's your preferred? Way of getting the band heard to you personally. Me personally. Oh, I tell you. So this is a story. So there's a there's a um, a show's been cancelled next week at the venue, the cabin where I put on shows, and um, so suddenly there's a panic. We need we need a gig. So I've got a list of bands that have messaged me. You know, it's literally on my phone in the last two months asking for a gig, and so I sent the same message out to all of them. There's a free night. Can you play? And the response is what gets them the gig <laughs> because. Most of the response that got them the gig was, brilliant, can't wait, we'll be there, right? What time do you need us? The response that didn't get them the gig was a number of questions. Um, how long can we play for? Um, how much will you pay us? Um, what's the kind of deal with who's headlining? And those kind of questions, that puts me off straight away. This is just me, and, and people will tell you differently, I'm sure. I don't really care what the band sounds like, honestly. I just care that they're enthused and they want to be part of the thing. That's the truth. Okay, bad community. Just one more point before we move on. This, this idea of headlining a local band's night. I, do, I, know, I know it's good for your ego, and it? it looks good on the posters, but it's actually a curse. Because everybody else's mates have left by then. Absolutely. I've seen it so many times. You, it's a midnight slot. It's yeah. the worst slot to play, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and there's all this ego around wanting to be the headliner. I mean, this is a 400 capacity room that we're in now. And so many people are desperate to headline in here as if that makes you a better band, as if that makes you shindig more happening, <laughs> to quote someone's name. Um, <laughs> but it's all about just being part of the thing. Um, honestly, just be part of the local thing. You know, no one wants to support Manchester United anymore because no one knows if you're there or not, right? It's the same, no one wants to, if you go to Wembley to see Coldplay, Chris Martin doesn't know if you're there or not, he couldn't get two hoots. He might see your sparkly 
hand bracelet that he gives you, but honestly, who cares? He doesn't. He just pleads for the cash. If you go to the cavern and a band can literally see your eyes, they're delighted you're there. They're going to make the thing about you and you're going to make it about them. Uh, and that's, that's so much more valuable for me than getting to headline or getting to play in the room. Okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, so, so uh, do you want to talk a little bit about Bomb Fest? Because it's kind of a, it's kind of, a, on that theme there, it's kind of a, a national version of it, isn't it? You know, this, it's kind of joining the dots of these kind of like organisations and, and beyond that as well, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, with Bomb Bomb Fest, um, we set up a uh, music industry training development programme. Um, and what that culminated in was um, a gig at the Roundhouse, um, four nights of Frank Turner. It, 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 so it's one fest in association with Frank Turner. And the guys who were on the training development programme essentially um, um, helped to produce that, that gig. So it was great for music industry talent development. Um, but also at the same time, we recognised we recognised that it was, a, it was an ideal opportunity to um, to promote opportunity for uh, new and emerging artists. So um, we we created eight slots over um, the Saturday and Sunday uh, on the second stage, and we put a shout out via Music Glue for um, artists, bands, performers to put themselves forward. Um, we had 800, 800 people responding to that. We had 800 artists, performers, bands buying for eight slots. Um, so we went through a process of um, selection. We narrowed it down to 20 um, ourselves, the One Fest team. And then we put those 20 up for public vote, and we had 50,000 people <coughs> voting um, uh, for those to get that 20 down to eight. Um, so that just gives you an idea of how, how, <coughs> how massive the competition was for eight places. You've got a one in hundred chance. And then it gives you an idea how interested people are in supporting um, uh, young, new, emerging talent to get a break, if you like. Um, but the competition was just so intense. So with 800 people, 800 different bands, performers entering, how, how do they get themselves heard of all that? I mean, there's no way anybody's going to sit in the dark rooms to 800 demos. I mean, that would drive me insane, wouldn't it? So what what, what make anything stand out from the pile? Um, there were 800 demos submitted. Yeah. And someone did literally go through all those 800 demos. However, probably the first couple of seconds, that's all. So it's when you're putting a demo forward, it's it's... What's going to and what's going to uh, kind of you know grab someone's attention straight away? So it's the, the, the choice of the, of the song, the choice of the track, how you present yourself is, is kind of crucial. In the old days, people used to say only put three songs in a demo, but I would say just put one song. On I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, th that, that's all we wanted with with um, with uh, on this particular occasion is just put, you know just just send us one track. And um, the interesting thing is when we get down to the when we got down to the twenty. Um, it obviously um, those those twenty tracks went out to a much wider audience, and that got much more airplay. Was it twenty songs were just all brilliant four second intros? <laughs> <laughs> and then you get to the fifth second, go wow, what happened to that song? No, because that eight hundred was put down to kind of a hundred, and then the hundred got down to fifty, and the fifty yeah. got down to twenty. So there was a kind of there was a fairly robust selection process. But obviously, this is not really a super fair pro. I mean, it's, it's good you do it's, this, and it's great space, but it's, it's so many different styles of music work in different kind of ways. It's not going to work for everybody. This is. I mean, if you're a prog rock band. You've got a 20-minute intro. You're not going to get through, are you? Mate? No, absolutely. And, 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 but but it, it, it's one way. It's an example. Of, yeah, yeah. Um, of I mean, it's not, it's not your job to pinpoint all the times in the country in one go. You're just doing a, a quick snapshot of what's there, giving people a platform, giving people a space. And it, it was a, it, exactly. It's about providing an opportunity. And yeah. some people grabbed hold of that opportunity, and some people were lucky enough to go forward to the 20. The others that got, got through to the 8, were, you know, they, they got a lot of exposure. Um, and the winner even got to do a collaboration with, with, with Frank Turner. So, you know, it's, it's what I would say is, if, in terms of getting your music heard, it's looking out for opportunities like that and, 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 and identifying uh, chances where, you, you know, something different. 
It's not just about sending, you know, putting stuff on SoundCloud, that's great. It's not just about social media. It's also making sure that you're aware of what's happening um, as, as much as possible. So whether it's whether it's being aware of what John's doing at the cabin, or whether it's sort of being, being aware of what something like OneFest is doing on a, on a national basis. Yes, but I mean, it's important to be a hustler, isn't it? I mean, it's a lot easier now with the internet to do that as well, isn't it? It's not... It's, it's easier, but, but that creates more competition, because it's easier for everyone. Yeah, but you have to be the, the biggest hustler. You exactly. Have to keep going, <laughs> yes. going, going, going. I mean, yes. it's, like, yeah. it's, it's like, you know, three hours rehearsing, eight hours on the internet. I mean, that's, that's the reality of it. It's not... Music's not a charity, is it? It's not... Not everybody's going to get a space, not everybody's going to get a career out of this, you know. So you've got to keep pushing and pushing and pushing, haven't you? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I, I, you know, talking from my son's perspective, I've got an 18-year-old son who lives in the middle of rural Somerset. He's doing uh, music production at, at DBS in Bristol. Um, I just keep saying to him, just go out. Just get out. You, you know, get your music out there, whether it's via SoundCloud, SoundCloud or um, whether it's on his own Facebook page or whatever. But also, you know, as John says, go to lots of gigs and, and just be there. Um, and be there and ready for an opportunity. He turns up at the DJ nights and DJs, you know, the DJs are renowned for not turning up. Um, and he, he, he'll step forward. He's always got his music with him. He'll step forward and he'll, he'll put himself into a slot. It's interesting what John was saying as well. I mean, if, if something doesn't fit into those slots, you know, if you're the prog rock band with a 20-minute intro, you can't get in there because it, because everything's so tightly compacted the way what people are looking for and the way that everything's formatted. You create your own scene, don't you? You put your own gigs on, you create your own little world and build it from there, don't you? You could be your own promoter. I mean a musician it isn't just somebody who plays an instrument now. You have to be at three sixty, you have to be able to do everything, don't you? That's which brings us to you because uh, you said you played you were in a band, so Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so so it's yeah. not just playing the music now. You, you've got to be able to do the whole thing. That's right. It's um, it's much more. Um, it's it's gotten very digital recently. So, um, the skill set within the band, um, the way that, that that we work it is that every member of the band has an extra skill set, sort of aside from just playing the instrument. So we've got um, video editors in the band. We've got graphic designers. We've got um, prop makers, um, and just you know, so all sorts. So if we need to make a music video, if we need to film something, if we need to sort of turn something around really quick. Um, which, which, which generally isn't going to make a lot of money back, then, then obviously you need to make it cheap you know, before it goes out, so, so you're not just in a, this sort of endless black hole of losing cash, really. So if you skill the band you know, as much as possible, then, then that will obviously sort of reduce costs ongoing you know, in the future. I mean, obviously this helps to create opportunities for the band, because you can, if somebody needs something, you can actually create it. That's right. I mean, the, like, the world is getting much more sort of instant now. It's, it's very much, you know, it's a very sort of instant... Um, Kind of, you know, social media is very much happening now, you know, so um, you really have to kind of respond to that with, with, with the band and, you know, um, making your, like, your own media, your own content, um, sort of constantly pretty much, just, just to keep people constantly um, engaged, I suppose, the, the engagement is quite important, you know, keeping people interested, why, why should they listen to you, why should they follow you, why, why should they care, care week on week what you're doing, you know, that's the, so, you know, you have to kind of create that, those, those reasons and make that content you know, sort of in-house really, um, or else it could be very costly because you'd be paying a graphic designer or a photographer or somebody to, to, to do this. But, I mean, things like iPhones and stuff make this a lot easier now. There's a lot more technology out there, you know, it's much, it's never been easier to make that type of stuff. Is it, I'm not, is it, I mean, you're lucky you've got a band where everybody's got these capabilities, these, it, but, but you could pull these resources in a scene as well. They don't have to be in your band. That's I mean, right, yeah. Probably in this room, because everybody who's in a band is got each band's got different skills. You could share or swap skills well, couldn't you? I mean, the, the, day, right, the yeah. days when you used to go on a, a local band forums and they're all slagging each other off, hopefully <laughs> that's over because it just seems ridiculous. It's not really a competition, is it? No, it's not. that's it. Like, like, the, like, the best thing that you can do locally is, is to buddy up with the other acts. I mean, we've got sort of close band buddies that, you know, if we're putting on shows and stuff, we'll, we'll, we'll always try into those, those networks to make sure they're aware and they're helping us to sort of push them. The show forward, really. You know? Yeah, and it's not just doing shows, though, is it? It's, you know, somebody's got a web layout, That's or right, somebody's yeah. got social networking, you just pull all this information. That's because right. the way it's going to be, there's always going to be bands that are going to be bigger than your bands. It's That's just, right. It's yeah. just the yeah. natural way things go. It's, this doesn't mean you're better or worse, it just happens like that, doesn't it? It's kind of a moneyless trade in that sense, you know. Um, we're, we're, it's, you know you're famous sort of thing constantly. Um, but it works, you know, because it's you know this stuff would would cost money, so it's just another way of paying for it. So you know, there's no sort of shame in it. <laughs> and also, creative people, 
if they can actually do these kind of skills, they're probably going to do them better as well because they've got a creative mind. That's right. Into right. music and also, you know, be able to make videos or be able to do some of the stuff. That's well. it. And, and plus, they're, they're, they're more invested in it as well because obviously it's a friend and they're doing you a favour. And so there's, there's, the, there's that kind of personal link in. So you can put that pressure that you might not be able to put onto a company that you're paying, you know? So. But, and it's not necessarily that you have to have a band that's got loads of people, great graphic designers no. in the band. I mean, if you've got a band that somebody can drive, that's a skill that's right, swap to be yeah, yeah. do graphics in other bands. And plus, it's, 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 it's worth noting that we weren't born with these skills. I mean, when the band started, um, none of us had these, these skills. We've learned as we've gone, because we, we sort of realised, hang on a minute, these, these video directors are kind of expensive. I mean, it can cost anywhere between five and £20,000 to make a music video, you know? So if you can make, make your own, or, or you can tie with, say, like, a, like another director who's maybe already made a film, I mean, something which which we did recently. Um, we went to we went to Hollywood to play a show, and we whilst we were out there, we met um, with a sort of up and coming director who made this great CGI kind of film. We we just asked him, can we take edits from that and mix it with edits from the band and make it into a music video? And he he, he loved the idea. You know, he was really really excited about it, and um, and that obviously saved us a huge amount of cash. You know, we you know it was just it was just a conversation. But I mean, the the video which um, you know. It's, um, it looks very expensive. It looks like it costs all 20 or 40 grand or something, but it actually cost us like, you know, nothing. It cost us. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. so yeah. it's, you know, it's about thinking of, you know, sort of round problems, you know. There's another thing which, which, which we've done, which we took, um, you know, this is back to making music videos. We, um, we took old footage, which, was, which is now in public domain, and we mixed that with our own footage. So there's, there's, ways, there's ways that you can think around, you know, to sort of make, make content, you know. It's, um, with, with stuff that's already existing or, or already out there, if you like. And there was a skill that you mentioned, which is not necessarily this is a skill, but the cheeky ask, you know, the idea of asking a director if you can use that stuff. And you can spread that across a lot of different things, you know, the, you know if some, a big band is playing in Plymouth or Bristol, the cheeky ask for the sport, like sometimes there is no sport. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And um, a, a, a great example of that is, is I emailed uh, Megadeth about 2011, something like that, or, or uh, 2012, I just asked them for the show and said, 